the first thing that he mentions, Rahimullah, is al kathib which is, as we know, lying. And he puts it under the classification of haram. And that type of lying, the type of lying that's haram, is lying that has no benefit. And why do we say lying that has no benefit? Because in some cases, when there is benefit, the, the rule of lying changes. But the general rule of, li of lying is that it is haram. But it can also be wajib. For example, it's, it's, it's wajib to lie. For example, you know that, Mesalan, you're, you're walking down the street, you see a, a boy or a man running for fair out of his life. And then two minutes later, a bunch of uh, gangsters come up to you and say, did you see this uh, guy in a black jacket running down the street? And when you saw that guy who was running for his life turning right, you tell them, oh yes, I saw him going left. Because that line becomes wajib, because if you tell that person, if you tell those people that that person turned to right and they catch him, and they they harm him, uh, they take his money, or possibly they, they, they kill him or do a grievous crime to him, then you're like a person who supported them, in doing that crime so in this case it's wajib for you to tell to tell a lie in this case because it's for isla in order to uh, preserve the greater good and this is what's mentioned in 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 the commentaries of al-akhtari and going back to haram if a person lies in a manner that's haram like lying in order to gain a, uh, for example, a person who lies in order to gain a benefit that he doesn't have the rights to achieve. For example, uh, somebody calls you before the a, uh, a judge in order to be a witness and says to you, for example, if you if you lie, I, I'll uh, I'll pay you half of the of what I win from this case. You're lying here is haram. Or lying in order to help somebody achieve something, uh, which is basically the same, in order that that person may uh, gain some type of benefit. And then, as you can say, he'll, he'll break you off a piece of that benefit. Then it is not permissible for you to lie. So we have lying that is haram. right? And we have lying that is wajib. And we have a lying that is mandub, which is recommended. And that type of lying is in order to fix a problem between two people or two Muslims. For example, you know that Zaid and Omar don't like each other or they were once friends and something occurred between them and they stopped talking to each other it is permissible for you to go to Zaid and say you know Zaid Amr told me that he really misses you and you know you, you guys you know and thinks that you guys should really get together and then you go to the next person you say and you tell him the same thing but you tell both of them, just make sure that you don't mention to the other one that I told you this type of stuff because, you know, he's a bit shy. And you go back to the one, you tell him the same thing. You tell him, you know, maybe you guys should, you should, you know, maybe you should call him or Zaid. Maybe you should call Amr or Amr. Maybe you should call Zaid. But, you know, don't tell him that I spoke to you. So one of the two will call each other and they'll both be open-hearted to each other because of the news that you gave them. This is permissible because it's for Islah. And then inshallah, because you guys are all friends, after a few months when, you know, everybody's good, then you can say, hey, you know what I did, guys? And then you guys can have a, a laugh and say, alhamdulillah. But this is permissible, and this is what is written in the books. Are the commentary, commentaries of uh, al-Akhtari. And...
also we have al kazib that is makru that is disliked and they mention for example lying to your wife and I'm sure that in some cases that can be haram but here they mention in makru but they don't give an example unfortunately so in some cases just like the origin of the rule it can be haram and they also mention in some cases that it can be makru then he goes on to say walghibatu and ghiba means backbiting but according to the sharia when we say bike backbiting we mean to mention something about a person that if he was to hear it he would dislike it and know that that thing that he dislikes is true about him because if it wasn't true about him then we have something called al-buhtan which we call slander and that's even more grievous of a sin so backbiting is to mention something about a person that is true about the person but if he was to hear it he would dislike it and backbiting is is a very difficult thing to avoid and a very very difficult thing to avoid because it's one of the things that people least pay attention to and know that anything will be considered backbiting if you mention something about a person that's even in relation to him for example even if you say that you know his clothes are never ironed that's backbiting or you mention something about his child or his house or his car that if he was to hear it he would dislike it it is disliked or it is haram it is considered backbiting anything in relation to a person that if he was to hear it and, and, and didn't like it upon hearing it it's considered backbiting and if you were to mention something that did not exist in a person then that's considered buhtan and that's slandered slander or ghiba are backbiting both of them are requested to have a tawbah both of them are requested to have a tawbah and as you mentioned in the beginning of the book that's a tawbah that will be accepted after you seek forgiveness uh, uh, to seek forgiveness from that person who you back uh, who you backbit And since this uh, thing is so hard to avoid, one of the good things you could establish with people is not to mention the names of other people in your presence. Except for per per permissible means, but if a person, if uh, you know that a person is, uh, is accustomed to backbiting, you should make some type of deal with them or or some type of agreement that when we're talking together we won't mention the names we don't want to mention the name of of, of anybody or uh, I don't want you to mention to me the name of anybody and I won't mention to you the name of anybody and inshallah that will be a cure to uh, keep backbiting away as much as possible another form of backbiting which a person might not be aware of is as we said, if a person was to hear it, he would dislike it. And even if he was to see it, for example, at a school, they post all of a person's school marks or everybody in the class uh, class's school marks on a board with their names written on it. And his name shows up at the bottom. If he does not like that, that's considered backbiting. Because you mentioned something about him that he disliked upon hearing or seeing so it is a form of backbiting so a way to get around that is to give each number a student so that when they look at that paper they may know their own marks 
So the issue of backbiting is 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 very tricky, and for that reason, Ghazali in uh, Al Ghazali, rahimullah, in his Ihya al Muddin, gives a very detailed discussion on the matter of backbiting because it's something that people commonly fall into and are not aware of. After Al uh, Al Ghibatu, he mentions when Namimatu. And an example of Namima is to go between two people and say, do you know what so-and-so said about you? Or do you know what so-and-so, uh, so-and-so said about you? Meaning to reveal something that would be disliked upon being revealed. For example, I need to clarify the meaning of that because I haven't found a sufficient uh, English translation for this for this word but the idea of it is that like a person who runs between like a person who carries uh, carries tails and and uh, hopes by it that there will be some type of dislike in between them or some type of fitna for example Zaid said something about Abdullah and For example, Abu Bakr goes back and tells Abdullah that Zaid said said such a thing about him. But he's doing that in order to cause fitna between them. He knows that when he knows that when Abdullah hears that, that he's going to be very angry, very angry, very vicious with Zaid. So he goes and carries these tales in order to seek between them problems. So this is not permissible according to the Sharia and it is haram according to according to what uh, al Akhtari has mentioned here so know that carrying tales between people knowing that they're going to cause harm and fitna is a haram act then he mentions al kibr which is pride and a person who has pride will not enter Jannah even if he has an atom of it according to the famous hadith even if he has a little bit of pride he will not enter Jannah And that because and that is because when a person has pride, it's a form of denying the ni'ma of Allah on that person. For example, a person is uh, traveling, for example. And it's and it's time to pray. And he doesn't have a prayer carpet, so he wants he doesn't want to make sajda on the ground because he doesn't want to he doesn't want to get his forehead dirty, or he doesn't want to get a little dust on his pants. This is a form of kibr. Because instead of praying your salah and carrying it out as Allah has commanded you, you're more concerned about getting a little bit of dust on your forehead and a little bit of dust on your knees. This is a sign of kibr. Because a person who doesn't have kibr would make sujood to Allah whatever he was because that's what Allah has commanded him to do or another form of kibr is a person who doesn't pay his zakah because he feels that you know he's worked so hard to achieve his goods and these poor people are poor because they don't work hard and because I and because he worked hard he he feels he's achieved a certain status so he doesn't he doesn't 
pay his zakat because he doesn't believe that uh, the people, the poor people who have entitled, uh, who are entitled to that money, have worked hard enough for him and therefore don't deserve anything from his wealth. This is a form of kibr. And as we mentioned, that is because the reason why kibr is so disliked is because it is the denial of it is like denying the nitma that Allah has given. For example, even if that person did work hard, he did not achieve what he achieved except by the permission and the might and power of Allah subhanahu wa taala only, and not because of his efforts. So his wealth is a nitma from Allah, and not based on his his uh, ability to achieve are earned. But it shouldn't be mistaken as some people would assume that kibr is a person who you know that kibr is when a person for example dresses up or likes to dress up and knows he looks good. That is not a sign of pride if he if he doesn't if he does if he doesn't do it in order to show off in front of people but for example there's some people who like to wear uh, nice shoes and look nice and there's some people who when they dress nice they know they look nice this is not a form of of kibr right and that's uh, based on a famous hadith about the person who came to the prophet sallallahu and said that he likes you know to have sandals that nobody else has and the Prophet ﷺ responded to him, Allah is beauty and he loves beauty. So this is not a form of kibr, which we assume is kibr according to uh, in our Western culture that when a person, you know, gets a nice pair of uh, new white shoes yeah, and, he, and he puts a little extra walk on his, uh, on his strut, people assume that this is considered kibr, but it's not kibr. There's nothing wrong with a person knowing that he looks good, or or sisters have a get together and they and they uh, and they put on their nice clothes. They know they look good and they like to dress up. There's no problem with that, and it's not considered kibr. Examples of kibr are the ones that we mentioned uh, are the ones that we mentioned before, and a person can also have kibr against a, on 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 a person to have pride on a person. Right, and that's like a person who goes and becomes well educated or well off or very wealthy businessman, and he refuses to uh, come out to certain gatherings or or pray jama'ah in the masjid because the general people in that community are people who are not of his class, so he refuses to pray with them or he refuses to eat with them he refuses to sit on the floor and eat with them because he doesn't see them from his class this is a form of kibr and it is haram because it is like the, as you mentioned because it is like the denial of the ni'mah of Allah on that person after that he mentions wal-ujub and al-ujub huwa ajib al-ujub is something very strange and al-ujub is when a person looks at his worship and he's astonished by it for example we're in the month of Ramadan and all the brothers are doing itikaf and uh, they wake up the next morning and a brother comes on and says, "Oh man, I'm, I'm so tired, man." And brother's like, "Well, why are you so why why are you so tired?" He's like, "Oh man, I was up last night, you know, doing all these extra prayers, man. Everybody else was asleep, and I, I don't think anybody else could have did it. While I was up and I prayed, you know, twenty rakats, you know, it was rough, man. I I gotta get some sleep because uh, you know I'm, I got I gotta do it tonight. You know, usually when I do it, everybody's sleeping." This is what we consider a form of ujub, a person who looks at his ibadah and he's astonished of what he does. And this is 
one of the tricky parts for a person when he takes a Tarika and goes through levels for example now he's at level 1 and now he's at level 2 and now he's at level 3 and now he's at level 4 and now he's at level 5 he may be tricked to believe that now that he's become a certain height he's not on the level 1 so he's astonished by the fact that he can sit down and say subhanallah a thousand times or a certain amount of times are because he's met he's hit a certain amount of levels and he's astonished by by his by his accomplishment so these type of things we have to be aware of and if Allah does raise us in status then we have to be sure to make uh, shukr and alhamd and not to become astonished by our acts and forget that it's only Allah that has empowered us and gave us the ability and the tawfiq to reach the levels that we have reached and just as fast as he can bring us up he can bring us down inshallah ask Allah for tawfiq and moving on we go on to Ar-Riya Ar-Riya is to do something translated as showing off but it means to do something or to perform an act of worship in order to gain something from people and for example riya is split into two categories number one is called riya ikhlas and that's to do something a type of worship for the sake of people only and then we have the second one called riya shirk which means to do some type of worship for the sake of Allah and for the sake of people so Riya al-Ikhlas is worse than Riya al-Shirk we said a Riya al-Ikhlas is to do some is to do some type of act or some type of worship to get close to people or or the second class Riya al-Shirk is to do an act to get close to people I mean to get close to Allah and to get close to people at the same time. An example of that. At a particular mosque, for example, let's just say there's always or sometimes there's a man who comes in on particular days and gives charity to the students of knowledge or the memorizers of Quran. Okay? And so this student is sitting in the masjid and at this moment he's not doing any work he's relaxing and then he sees the man walk in so as soon as this man walks in the man is walking around you know giving some sadaqah to people he picks up his Quran and he starts reading yeah and he's reading for the sake that this person might come around and honor him and possibly give him any some some money because he's a because he's a, a student of knowledge or one memorizing Quran so he picks up the, that Quran for the sake of seeking closeness to that person and not for the sake of Allah that is called Riya al-Ikhlas or second for example are, are the second class Riya al-Shirk a person is reading the Quran already and that person who walks in with wealth comes around so he starts reciting in a certain manner and in a certain way in order that that person might recognize that he's there and therefore come his way and give him from some uh, and, and, and and to give him some of his wealth so at the beginning he was reciting for the sake of Allah and when that man walked in he started to recite for his sake in order to gain something from him this is what we call ar 
meaning showing off, meaning you're showing this act of ibadah in order to gain something from the people or doing it either, for, as we mentioned, either for the sake of the person only or for the sake of Allah, then for the sake of for the sake of, of, of people. And um, this is a very slippy matter that shaitan plays on people when people stand to give da'wah. When we're going to give da'wah, we have to always check our hearts and check our attentions because when fame comes around the corner, it is difficult to save oneself from ar When you're standing on the stage and you're giving a speech and you see the reaction of the people and they're very pleased with what you're saying at that point you have to seek refuge in Allah and make sure that you refrain yourself from falling under the dangers of ar Wasumatu. is to do something for the sake of Allah then to mention it to people for some worldly reason for example to do some act of uh, for example a person our student of knowledge who's giving a lesson you know starts to talk about everything that he's accomplished for the sake of letting the people know that he's accomplished accomplished uh, so much for example I memorized this for example the person mentions for example he went and he studied and he memorized these things for the sake of Allah. Then after that, he mentions, "Oh, you know, I memorized this text, I memorized that text, and you know, uh, I have ijaz in this, and I have ijaz in that, and so on and so forth." Which is permissible when you want to, in, when the people want to know what it is that you studied, but to always mention your your your, your qualifications can end up coming under the class of as-sum'at and we must to be aware and careful of it because it's also very tricky and uh, easy matter to get caught up in so that is what so that's the meaning of sum'at to do some some form of worship any for the sake of Allah and after that to inform the people about this act or these actions for some type of worldly gain which can come worldly gain uh, so that people can respect you or that people can call you a scholar or any or so on and so forth or people can call you successful purpose a uh, successful person these this is what we call a sum'atu Then he mentions Rahimahullah al Hasad. And al Hasad we can call envy. And to define it, it is to wish that something will be, that a blessing will be moved from a person in order that you can obtain it. And that is the lighter form of Hasad. Huh? The lighter form of Hasad is to wish that some a, a type of blessing will be removed from a person so that you can obtain it and the one that is very that is more severe is the re, the wishing that uh, the, re, the to wish that something is removed from a person even if you can't obtain it now i always like to mention a rule here and A very nice principle that if you think about it and put it into practice it will make your life more at ease and comfort and that is that although some things are 
not acceptable, they're understandable. Huh? For example, this first class of al hasad is that a person wishes that something is removed in order that he can obtain it. An example is that of an example of that is that a person feels or has envy because you're in a certain position. In because of his weakness of Iman, he feels that he can't get in that position unless you're removed from it. Yani Allah has given you a ni'mah to be in a certain position. And he wishes to be in that position, but he feels that in order to obtain that position, you have to be knocked out of your spot in order that he can obtain it. This is the type of hasad that we can say that is understandable, but not acceptable. Why do we say it's understandable? Because human beings, when it comes to livelihood, generally become weak. So due to the weakness of iman, they 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 start to look at cause they start to focus on cause and effect and not Allah as being all powerful. So he for example, a person has a good salary as a manager in a job. And a person is having financial uh, another person is having financial uh, problems and he has the ability to become that manager but he can't become a manager until you are removed from that spot so he wishes that you are removed from becoming a manager so that he be so that he can become a manager in order to support his family better because he'll get a better salary we there we therefore can say that although it's not acceptable we understand why he's in that state because of a, because of his weakness of iman He's starting to turn his focus to cause and effect and not to the power of Allah. But the second type of hasad is not, and this is what, then this is hasad, yani hakiki, yani in reality, that this person wishes that this blessing or this nitma will be roof, removed from this person even if he cannot obtain it. So his objective here is not to gain some benefit. But he just doesn't want to see that person enjoy that blessing that Allah has provided for that particular individual. So that is hasad al-hakiki to wish that, just to wish that that person does not enjoy that blessing and to have it removed from him. That is not acceptable and not understandable. And that is al-hasad a'udhu billahi min thalik. May Allah save us from that. Al Burdu. Then he goes on to mention Al Burdu. And Al Burdu is anger. And what did he mean by Burdu? Is when a person is angry at another person. Because of their state, it's 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 very close to hasad. For example, a person, a friend of his, gets a good job, and he gets a new car, and he buys a house for him and his family, and you're still stuck in a difficult financial statement. I mean, financial uh, situation, and therefore, you're very upset with that person because of the state that you're in. And because of the state that he's in, you know, if, you know why is you know you, you're thinking to yourself, why am I in this state? You know what I mean? This guy's got a new car, you know. This guy's got a new house. He's he's got a you know, you know everything's happy for him. You know, instead of being happy for the brother, he has bored. He has anger because he feels that he should also be in a better uh, better position and that he deserves a better position. The 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 danger of this disease is that that person who has al bukht is dissatisfied what Allah has provided for him and maybe little does he know that Allah has something good for him around the corner but because of his uh, bad opinion of Allah 
and his carrying al-bukht, he may be prevented from having that thing in which was good for him because of the fact that he wasn't pleased with what Allah or he wasn't pleased with the situation or wasn't patient with the situation that Allah has provided for him and therefore has denied the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's al-bughd and inshallah we'll stop here Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in